Good evening, salam alaikum, everyone. It is great to see so many of you here. We sort of thought that this talk would be popular and you have exceeded our expectations. I want to welcome you. My name is Mariette Westermann. I'm the Vice Chancellor of New York University Abu Dhabi. I'm the second Vice Chancellor, recently arrived in August. But as I think many of you know, I do have a history with the institution having been uh, sent out here to try to imagine it, to begin to imagine it and build a team to implement the vision for MW Abu Dhabi, having been sent out by one of the two people you all have come to hear, John Sexton, the former president, the president emeritus of New York University. <laughs> I am therefore so pleased that it is my honor and privilege and pleasure to uh, talk uh, a little bit about this conversation that you're about to hear about John's most recent book published earlier this year, Standing for Reason, the University in a Dogmatic Age. I'll say a little bit more about the book in a minute. But first, uh, I am excited to introduce two speakers, two proverbial speakers who need no introduction. Why do, do, why do, why do James Traub and John Sexton not need introductions? Well, first of all, both of them have been a very, very major part, a founding part of New York University Abu Dhabi from the very start. As you know, Emily Abu Dhabi was born of the joint vision of Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and President John Sexton when they started talking in 2006. And my, did that vision grow into a magnificent, magnificent institution, campus, community. It's an extraordinary uh, uh, thing to have seen and witnessed and it's been a pleasure for me for the first three years I've been a part of it and then to have returned so recently. So we know them. John is the founding visionary and James, as one of the two first teachers in the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Scholars Program that has been led now for many years and envisioned by Diane Yu. Uh, John and uh, Jim, from the start, taught together the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Scholars, of whom we have many here tonight. We're very delighted that you're here with us. This is a beautiful program that puts into action the idea that universities are more than institutions that educate a particular set of students. That universities bring research and knowledge and community enrichment into their host nations, as they do here. And so the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed scholars are some of the most talented and extraordinary students who don't attend MWA Abu Dhabi directly, but who are enrolled in UAE University, or in Zayed University, or in the higher colleges of technology. And they come to us for a full year of additional academic training, leadership training, uh, and exposure to what a research university like New York University, both in New York and here in Abu Dhabi, has to offer. And from the very start, before we ever had a university or a campus here, in 2008, uh, John and Jim together have taught in that program for which we are very grateful. And uh, in fact, they're deeply involved to this day, as I think you'll hear. So that's why they kind of didn't need that introduction. The second reason they don't really need an introduction is that they are both New Yorkers. And they're very good friends. And, you know, in, at MW Abu Dhabi, we don't believe in stereotypes. But you know what they say about New Yorkers? They're very well-spoken, they're plain-spoken, they're great raconteurs, and they'll tell you all about themselves. And I'm sure that they will do that. Nonetheless, they are also great friends of mine and of this institution, and so I'm very eager to take this couple of minutes on the stage uh, to say a few words about what makes them so special and why we are so thrilled to have this public conversation between them. So first, Jim Traub. Um, Jim is a great expert on foreign policy. He's a historian of foreign policy, and he has made his life in the world for, for many, many years as an outstanding journalist and 
writer and, and really public inte intellectual. Uh, even if you don't know it, you probably have read him at some point or another. He's a very fine writer indeed. He's written for all the great uh, journals and been, they've been on staff of several, the New Yorker, the New York Review of Books, the New York Times Magazine most recently, uh, also the Atlantic Foreign Affairs, uh, the New York Times itself, a uh, very important writer. He also, as, a, as an incredibly curious person, he sort of embodies the vision of liberal arts education that we promote here at MOE Abu Dhabi. Uh, his books are so wide ranging. He wrote a very interesting uh, political biography of Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, really both kind of, kind of laying bare some of the challenges uh, and also the victories that Kofi Annan had in the role. He wrote a biography more recently of uh, John Quincy Adams. And when I asked him, Jim, why are you writing a biography of John Quincy Adams? He very honestly said, he's the only founding father about whom there is no modern biography. And it turns out to be much more uh, of a book than that. It's really worth reading, came out a few years ago. Most recently, just this year, he also has published a new book uh, with an elegiac title, perhaps. It's called, what was liberalism? What was liberalism? The past, present, and promise of a noble idea. And I have asked uh, Jim later in the year uh, to give us some kind of event like this about that book, but that is not for uh, this evening. This evening, he's interviewing John Sexton about his book. And it's not just that he's a great friend and interviewer that gives him that qualification. Uh, Jim also has a deep, understanding of higher education and a deep commitment to it. And in fact, one of his first books is a wonderful account called City on a Hill about a city college in New York University where he basically embedded himself for 18 months, kind of getting to know the institution, one of his earliest books from the 1990s. And so I could think of no one, no one more apt and uh, also entertaining to interview John Sexton about his most recent book on higher education. You all know John in some capacities or other, so I will say only a very few things and just call out these, these terms that will evoke him for you. President Emeritus of New York University, the largest private university in the world, I think, and certainly the only truly global network university that is was born of his vision and energy. Dean Emeritus of NYU School of Law, beneficiary of a Jesuit education, proponent of liberal arts education, debating coach for high school girls, constitutional scholar, visionary leader in higher education, but foremost to me, and I think for this university, but foremost to me, he is a teacher. He is an educator. You've already heard about his founding role in the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Scholars Program that he, he envisioned together with Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. He is a rare university president who always taught a full, a full course load while he was president of this gigantic university. And he still did all this incredible work. I saw it firsthand when I worked for him for nine years. Um, and I, try, I will try to follow his lead, but I'm just gonna keep it to one course a year. That, I think that'll be quite enough for me. Second, John, to so many of us here, to so many in the world, is a mentor, an extraordinary mentor. Um, and I want to just say, thank him for that. And I want to thank him for being a mentor to me and for entrusting me the way that only a mentor can, for entrusting me a relatively untried academic leader, a relatively untried dean uh, of a small school of NYU, although one of the best, Institute of Fine Arts, um, and trusting me with carrying out his vision, beginning to carry out his vision and planning for that, building with a team. Of course, I never did it alone. He was the closest partner, and so were all these others, most importantly, Al Bloom, 
Fabio Piano and Hilary Ballen, uh, but entrusting me and sending me over here as employee number one, trying to figure out how we were gonna build this vision that was a constantly evolving vision because John's ideas are never static. They kind of, those goalposts get moving and moving and moving. And he entrusted me to try to get there. Two little anecdotes from that time that show you what a great mentor he is. The first has a lot to do with this venue here. This presentation tonight, this public conversation, uh, takes part as a program in our New York University, our NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. And the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, this university entity, existed before we ever had a university here. It was one of these chutzpah kind of moves that we made. And it was really, I think, in the fall of 2007 that Hillary and Bellin and I came to John as we were starting this up and had no idea how to begin really and said, the first thing we have to do is bring professors from New York University to Abu Dhabi so they understand that you can actually have a university here, that this is an interesting place to live, an interesting place to be, and that we can engage. And when we do that through this imaginary entity called the NWA Abu Dhabi Institute, we will also thereby give people in the Emirates the opportunity to see what a university, what, a, what the plenitude of a research university can bring to a country, even if your own child might in the end not go to that institution. And so off we were to the races. I thought John was gonna declare us crazy, but instead he said, yes, that's exactly what we should do. And then he took us up 10 notches and made it that much bigger, full of research, full of arts programming and so forth. And here we are uh, 12 years later. So that was one of those moments where John just had the confidence that we, that we could figure this out without, with actually no one on the ground at the time. The second is an even more, uh, more impressive act of confidence. We promised, we promised our partners here that we would open this university in 2010. We signed an agreement in 2007. Three years later, we were gonna have a campus, we were gonna have a first class of students, we were gonna have faculty, curricula, research, arts programs, sports, uh, places where people live, we were gonna have it all. It was kind of crazy to say that we could do it, but in this country, things can be done fast, which is interesting. Nonetheless, John was very adamant, rightly adamant, that we should only have the very best students from around the world. And recruiting that first class of students was gonna be hard. And it was gonna be hard to meet these metrics where we said these students are gonna be better than any in the aggregate, little secret, any in the aggregate we can recruit at NYU at the time. The place has gotten a lot better since, but that was our promise. And there was one moment when we had begun our recruiting, we were almost ready to go live with a full recruitment effort, where John said, you know what, I don't think we're ready. I'm not sure you guys are gonna get there. And we were on a call with several, uh, several of the people I've mentioned and others uh, to have kind of a powwow about this. So John was very involved and he asked us extremely good questions and we kept saying, but this, but that, we think we can do it. And then he said, well, you know, maybe we'll just start the first year with all students from New York University. Do you remember that? All students from New York University. And then they'll come for study abroad and we'll pick the best. And we said, John, you know, we can't do that. We've promised that we will bring the best from wherever in the world we can find it, new and fresh students to NYU Abu Dhabi. And we had a really good back and forth. And in the end, he, 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 let, he let his apprentices run with it, made us responsible to be sure, held us accountable, but he also stepped stuck with us and came to every candidate recruitment weekend and so forth and really helped tell the story and recruit our first fantastic class of 2014. So for all that confidence and all that you bring, thank you so much, John. We will now hear their public conversation on a book, uh, again, Standing for Reason, the University in a Dogmatic Age. I read it at an early stage uh, of the manuscript, which was a real honor and uh, I think this, this conversation is gonna do great justice to it, but I want to say this is an incredibly important book, not just about higher education, although it is, but also about um, the state of our civil society in this time. And it makes excellent recommendations for how we might do things a little bit differently.
So I am just very, very pleased to give you John Sexton and James Trout. I think we're good. I first want to say I'm so happy that my students are here to have heard Mariette's introduction. They're going to treat me with awestruck respect <laughs> after this. So thank you, Mariette. Uh, so, so John, let's, let's start from the beginning of this thought process. So, Can I start with something? Can I say no to that question? <laughs> No. So, so I, I just, I just want to say to the magnificent Marriott, it's so good to see you return home. And we could not have... <laughs> when we began these conversations in illo tempore, you know, once upon a time, uh, the first team that came over was all women, five women, and Marriott led it. And she's very generous uh, in, in, in giving credit to me. I want to say I got the privilege of telling the story, but it was people like you and Fabio, it was the great Hillary Ballin, it was Linda Mills, Diane, um, the confidence of people here, my beloved Zaki, like you, who you've always been there for us. Uh, this is a great collective story. And it would be very, very wrong for anybody to attribute it to me in any major way. If there's one person to whom we should attribute it, it's Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed who showed the extraordinary vision, who, who, who thinks of a country not quarters or years ahead, but generations ahead. Uh, and we were very, very fortunate to be here and then to have people of the talent of the people that came here that then enabled me to tell the story. So here I am to tell some stories with, with probably, with all due respect, and I'm saying this realizing it's, it's being sent out, uh, but we have taught together. We've taught side by side in the Sheikh Mohammed's, but we're never in the same classroom. But actually, we have taught a course, Baseball as a Road to God, together, until after three years of doing it with me, he decided that uh, I was too intellectually empty to continue. <laughs> And, that is not but, true. But the this, books John assigned were too intellectually empty, <laughs> not John himself. But in any case, I, I'm, I'm now going to undergo conversation with, with my, my brother by another mother, this, this, great, this, this, this great friend of mine whom I love dearly, who, who likely is the smartest person that I've met other than Lisa Ellen Goldberg, who could have whipped his rear end. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so you, you were going to start. Right. So, so let's, the, the premise of your book is that there is a crisis out there, uh, which you call a crisis of secular dogmatism. So could you first explain what you mean by that? A and also, where do you think it comes from? Why are we having this crisis? Well, first, thank you for bringing me right away to the vocabulary of what I would call the core metaphor that's both behind my diagnosis of the existing problem and my optimism about, about the future if we can name and address the issue. So, so the core metaphor is, in a way, autobiographical. And, and it starts, as you know, in 1956 in a high school classroom where an unbelievably, this is not a name that will be known to most of you, but to those to whom it's known, it will evoke uh, uh, deep feelings. 
a, a, a remarkably progressive man. This was 1956, so this is before John Kennedy is elected. It's before uh, Pope John the 23rd in my church. I'm a Roman Catholic. It's before the Vatican Council. And a Jesuit priest stood in front of a classroom in Brooklyn with a bunch of street kids. We were all boys in front of him. And he wrote on the blackboard four Latin words, extra ecclesia nulla salus, outside the church there's no salvation. And I went up to him after class and I said to him, his name was Daniel Berrigan. And I said, Father Berrigan, does that mean that my very best friend, Jerry Epstein, Jewish, can't go to heaven? And this progressive man, this brilliant man, this man that later went on to be one of the leaders of the peace movement in the United States, said, if you don't baptize him, he will not go to heaven. And this was something I thought of before I came over to teach the first group of Sheikh Mohammed scholars, because I had never taught such a group of students before in my life. And, and I wondered before I met them, once I met them, it was dispelled, but I wondered if they would be as I was then, where the whole notion of generating truth through critical inquiry uh, was, was taken as axiomatic, that this was a good thing. Uh, because in the 50s, yes, I was a debater, and I dealt in the world of ideas and seeking truth through conversation. But the real truths were revealed. The real truths came to me from Rome. Uh, and I couldn't discuss them with Jerry Epstein. Uh, he, there was, you know, you either believed or you didn't believe, and there was only one truth. Sixty years later, I could participate at the Emirates Palace Hotel in, now I'm going to introduce another word as a counterpoint to dogmatic, an ecumenical conversation that had 25 faith traditions in it, none of us giving up our own position, but each of us listening intently, not only to understand the other viewpoint as it was being articulated, but to understand how those with another viewpoint viewed us. As the poet says, if we could only view ourselves as others see us. So this is a deep, and there's a term for it in theological dialogue, which is called a, a genuinely dialogic dialogue, where there's an active attempt to put yourself in the other person's position and view back and then see the great mystery. So that, that 60 year arc is an arc of, of great positivity that I've seen and I've lived. Meanwhile, in 1956, my father was the head of the Democratic Party in Brooklyn. This is, for those of you who've not had a class with me, or this is an un compromising Brooklyn accent. Those of you that want to learn to speak English properly, you can tape this and practice. <laughs> so, so, but, but Brooklyn, the, the, the center of the universe, you know, my father ran Democrat, but he dealt with everybody. And 60 years later, we find that our politics, and it, I'm gonna speak principally of America, but as you know, we have conversations. This is not unique to America but it's grave in America. There, there, there is now about political thought and conversation a dogmatism which is more virulent, and by dogmatism I mean a kind of unsupported affirmation that you have the one truth, and anyone else is, is, that, is, that doesn't get it is at fault and has nothing worthy to say. And there's a chasm that, that you could almost call it a chasm of simplicity and simple mindedness maybe is a better way to put it even than simplicity because there's an analogy to nuance and complexity when the world's problems are greatest. And this has divided us so that now, and the last, point I'll make on this because there's a, a nice data point that, that, that gathers it all together. Now in America, the great majority of each 
of the two major political parties thinks that the other party is, is, is a danger to the country. A and whereas in 1956, the start of my metaphor between this theological arc in one direction and a political arc in the opposite direction, in 1956, only 4% of Americans told pollsters that they would be upset if somebody in their family married somebody from another political party. In 2016, that number was 40%. More than race, more than religion, more than any other factor, it was, I would upset. And, and so the bad news is this chasm exists. The good news is that over 60 years, we managed to create an ecumenical dialogue in the realm of theology. And to me, that says it's possible to do in the realm of politics. It might be quixotic, but we should try. And the place to start is in our universities. I'm not going to let you leave the bad news that quickly. Um, when you say 60 years, this vast span of time uh, over which infinite numbers of things have happened. So it doesn't provide much of a sense of, of what the causes of this thing are. And so is this a thing that you would have said, neither you nor most of us would have noticed or thought about 20 years ago, 15 years ago? So just, I think, for the benefit of all of us to say, OK, when did this thing, this dogmatism, seize hold of the American public? And therefore, what, what events, what dynamics are connected to it or, or caused it? So, so I'll answer that in two levels, and I'll try to be. You always, he, 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 he accuses me rightly of being a bloviator. And, no, I, but I didn't interrupt you at all just now. No, no, I know you didn't, but I could, your body language was not good. I was watching. I, I thought I disguised it you, better No, no, than you that. didn't disguise it at all. All right. Just, and, you and still every, have no every, idea how much I was minimizing my body language. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But, but in any case, I'll try. So, yeah. so, so two levels. First of all, I recommend very strongly for those of you that haven't had the chance to read it yet, a 1991, so notice how relevant this is, a 1991 book by a brilliant man named Albert Hirschman called The Rhetoric of Reaction. And in, in there, I quote a little passage from it in, in, in my book, but in there he talks about how in a two-party democracy, forces inevitably, and he uses other examples, for example, the French Revolution. And so it's not simply in America's two-party democracy. But he tells the story of three tectonic changes, the French Revolution being one, and how rhetorical tropes develop on each side. And he says, but particularly in a two-party democracy, at the end of a certain period of time, these are almost exactly his words, you end up with two sets of people divided by a chasm of silence, no discourse, with each saying about the other, how did they ever get to be that way? And he wrote that in 1991. So there, there is something fundamental, okay? But I think it, the American story is a story that one can trace and see accelerating, which, which has, in my mind, two principal causes. One is uh, coming out of the anti-war movement and Watergate and the beginning of distrust of our government and our leaders, and then our churches in a parallel track, and and then our corporations, there's been an accelerating uh, uh, growth of distrust. And sadly, we now have uh, a president who, uh, who deals in selling distrust. And we have major candidates in the Democratic Party who also toss around the words like, corruption and rigged and so forth. So this corrosive growth of distrust seems to have accelerated, and, and that's one major cause. And then an, another is, as with everything, in, 
in the, the whole uh, development of social media and, and the fragmentation of society has enabled and accelerated uh, a, a, a kind of search and confirm you know, find that which confirms your views and then live in the cave of your own belief. And of course, that connects to this dogmatism metaphor. So I think things uh, have, have gotten worse and are accelerating. And we, we may be at an existential moment. I refer to universities as the last best hope. So um, well, let's talk about this last best hope. Um, now, there will be many people here in our audience tonight whose own experience of a university will not have been a Western university. And so when you say that if there is a last best hope in the face of this rising absolutism, dogmatism, unwillingness to accept fact and reason, um, and that the university is the bulwark, are you thinking uh, of the Western University, of the university where you have played such an important role and kindred ones? Would that be familiar to people who have been to universities, for example, in the, in, in the Middle East? Is it in the nature of the university, or you're talking about this particular growth in the United States and Europe of these Western institutions? So, uh, first of all, I want to make it very clear that I don't think that our universities, no matter which way you define your question, would get an A grade right now. So, so I, I, what, what, I'm, what I do in the book is try to call those of us in the university community to a certain what I'll call baseline, I call it in the book traditional view of the university, and then put out a second call if folks respond to that call to at least a segment of the university community to create what I call the ecumenical university, the most significant instantation of which is NYU Abu Dhabi and, and the Global Network University. So I, I, I mean, uh, I, I expect there will be more than one NYU Abu Dhabi. It won't be the model for every university, but, but there'll be a special part of the university orchestra that will practice aggressive ecumenism. Uh, but but both, the, uh, both in the traditional sense and in this ecumenical sense, th there's much work to be done. So I, I, I start with that. And I, I start with the fundamental characteristics of a university that would go beyond the American university, if you think about it. Uh, so you, you have professors here in the room. You know, so what, what, what do we do? We, we, we trade in ideas. We, we, we trade in nuance and complexity. OK, sometimes we're accused of being too nuanced and too complex, you know, making simple things complex. But the fact of the matter is that what we do is nuance and complexity and, and deep examination of things. We trade aggressively in a public way. We want to be up here, you know, as you will be on your, this is, this is like, why you, this is fun, is, is to, to have folks take you seriously enough to give up two hours, for God's sake, on a Sunday night to come here and, and listen to a known bloviator? I, I mean, this is a remarkable thing. But it's what we want, and we put our ideas out there, right? We put our ideas out there. Now, uh, as you know, Baseball as a Road to God was a Penguin book. It was done by a, and Penguin wanted to do this book. But I said, no, no, this, this has got to be done by a university press. This has got to be footnoted. This has got to be peer reviewed. This has got to be out, because I'm, I'm launching it into the world of ideas. Okay, so that's what we professors, this is inherent in the university enterprise. And then there's this whole set of people out there called peers, and their lives and reputations depend on their ripping this to shreds. Right, so there's, a, there's a, so there's this very transparent, and it builds generation to generation. 
So, so th this is in the fundamental nature of the universities, going back to Bologna. Uh, you know, so this is not an American invention. But is it a Western one? It sounds oh, no, like you're describing no, no, a Western no, no, university. No, 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 no. Look, if, 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 if my colleague David Levering Lewis were here, he would talk about the, 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 the great growth of the, the, the uh, Arab university, for heaven's sakes. And the, the, I mean, the Chinese are going to get their third turn as the leaders of the w w world. And they have a tradition you know, that goes back, at the very least, to Confucius. So, you know, let's not think that America invented critical thinking. Okay, okay, no student of, I have a doctorate in religion, no student of religion could, 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 could say that. And I'm not talking about the theological stuff, but the collateral stuff. Now, that having been said, I have a paradigm that I put out there. Interesting, as you know, the, but not surprisingly, as my brother by another mother, the paradigm is not the university. I st the, 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 the section, there are four sections of the book. There's an introduction called Charlie Sent Me. There's a conclusion called Being Worthy of Lisa. My, some of you will recognize those two. But there are four sections to my argument. It is an interlocking argument. And after setting up the diagnosis, you open the second section, and it, where does it start? In competitive debate. And what are the qualities of competitive debate? Competitive debate is, first of all, it's the same topic for the entire year. So if you're very glib and you've done your preparation well and the tournament is October at the beginning of the academic year, you may make it to the final round and you're doing your speech in front of the other competitors and they're all hearing your arguments and the opposing side's arguments. If you come back with the same arguments a month later, you're not going to have a chance because everybody's going deeper and deeper into the topic. In the individual debate, you can't just exchange talking points the way they do in what they call presidential debates. No, you can't do that. There are four iterations of argument by each side, and there's a judge in the back of the room that's flowing the argument. It's called extending the argument, and we'll see whether or not you encountered. And then another feature of it is you don't know which side you're on until the coin is flipped just before the debate. So you've got to be prepared with all of the arguments. On, and the final thing is, the single most important attribute of a champion competitive debater, as opposed to a very good competitive debater, is that he or she is an excellent listener. Because if you don't listen carefully to what your opponent has said, you may not join issue with the argument. That is, for me, whether you call it Western, Eastern, you know, uh, uh, global or whatever. I, I, that's the essence of a university, is to teach that kind of thinking, to live that kind of life, and to live it out in the attributes that the university uniquely, I mean, I mean we are a perpetual institution. We don't have to think, and, and, and we will be judged by the centuries. And our thoughts will be judged by the centuries. And, and those features don't exist outside the university. And, and that's why I say I have, I have hope for it. And so the thing you're describing, this intellectual dispassion, this sense of the integrity of the intellectual process, which I think you're saying is above all valued in the university, though of course not only in the university. So, so let's talk about that because that's so central to everything you're saying. Before we move into that specifically, I just want to, I promise this will be short. There is this other magisterium, as you know, for those of you that want to go to this place in the thought process, which is treated in my book, Baseball as a Road to God. And, and that is the ineffable, which is not, in my view, the province of the university, but has to do with things like love and the, the, the deep questions that I don't think one comes to know cognitively, uh, such as what life means. I don't want people to think, as I go down this debate analogy with you, that I have forgotten that part. No, but nor do you think that the intellectual life of a university consists just of logic chopping, right? No. One is always That's seeking right. the deepest possible answers, even if you recognize you can't reach them, you know? 
It's what Elliot called a raid on the inarticulate. You're trying to make that. You're trying to get there. Guys, I've gotten you to quote. Okay. Elliot, that's as good as I can, uh, <laughs> I can so, okay. do. I wrote, my I, no, I wrote my dissertation on him. Uh, no, not that Elliot. T.S. Elliot, the other Elliot. I know that. Um, so, some people, when they hear you talk about the university in this idealized way, will say, well, wait a minute. That sounds really beautiful. And that is what a university should be. Alas, it's not. And so uh, we have all become acutely aware in recent years of uh, this um, uh, controversy over whether, above all, elite universities, in, uh, and chiefly in the West, have become so, uh, become places where people are so afraid of saying certain things because they will offend the, the dominant mentality that, in fact, they are no longer those places of agnosticism, dispassion, respect for one another's point of view. Do you view that as being a parody? I believe that there is a cottage industry that propagates that view of a university for purposes that have nothing to do with truth or creating a corrective in the university in the direction of doing better. Is it possible that just because there's ill-intentioned criticism, there, isn't, there is also justified criticism? I, I was just about to say that I, I also believe that universities are far from perfect. I think I said that at the beginning and have a great deal of work to do to move in the direction of, of, of the ideal. Specifically on the point you raise, um, I, I would again make two points. I'll make them quickly and you can follow up or people can later with questions. I think a great deal that would come under the flag that you describe of you know, uh, creating a reluctance by some to speak, uh, is, is sad and we should work hard to aggress it, to address it. But I also believe a lot of it is progress, is, is actually uh, creating a greater awareness of people in, in people about uh, the way their words are heard by others to whom they maybe haven't paid any attention or who haven't been able until now to say, that hurts. And, and you're hurting me when you say that. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I, uh, I have gained so much as a teacher from the last 12 years coming here to teach the two different sets of students that I teach here. Uh, one of them, the NYU Abu Dhabi students who literally come from all over the world and about whom you'd be a failure as a teacher if you made assumptions, certainly assumptions based upon uh, physical appearance or, or accent or, or, or uh, you can't tell where they're from and what intellectual uh, 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 baggage and gifts they're bringing into the room. You really have to work. And, and then the other group of students who, who come from this spectacular place, uh, virtually all of them come from the Emirates, uh, not all, but virtually all, a, a place about which I knew virtually nothing 12 years ago. And, and the, 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 to try to be uh, useful to them as a professor is, is an effort of trying to understand how things I might say, which would be completely communicative with my students in New York wouldn't be here and might indeed be hurtful here to either or both of those groups of students. So uh, there's an awful lot that is parodied in the critique by the cottage industry that, that I'm, very, I'm willing upon extension of the conversation to defend, but I don't want you to think at all uh, that, that I think that uh, Universities right now, most universities right now, get better than a B grade at this. But is the, and I think by the way, 
all of you, when you read John's books, Bach book, as you will, of course, all do, uh, will see that there's a very sensitive passage in which John talks about exactly this question of uh, that, that this, the possibility of being hurt is a, a direct consequence of the commitment to diversity of institutions. And people who, for the people who have always gone to these universities, in effect, have always controlled the discourse. And, and now there's all sorts of people there who were previously left out of that discourse. And that is why there are a lot more uh, sensitivities that the discourse didn't care about and you would talk about without thinking and that now are, uh, uh, can be hurt. Can I, I, I there's also a, a stereotype, that you put that beautifully, that comes in th that the new speaker is the angry protester. And, and what, I, what I try to say, as I thought about this for the book, in terms of how universities could, could uh, reach closer to the ideal, what I began to realize, working from this, uh, the, the role, my role as a teacher, or my parallel role, if I'm making a, a, an oral argument to the Supreme Court of the United States, and there are nine justices, and, and it's really important for me to know how the two that are on the fence on the issue are hearing what I'm saying, okay? So, so both the teacher and the oral advocate in that regard are very much trying to view it through the audience. Now, now when someone rises who has not had voice to confront those of us who have had voice and the privilege of agenda setting and the privilege of forum and says, when you say this, you hurt me. I don't think that we who've had the privilege of voice and agenda fully uh, appreciate how much faith that person is putting in us because they're weaponizing us. They're telling us how to hurt them. And they're almost saying, I have confidence in you that if we get it, and I think we have to, that imposes on us, in my view, an extraordinary burden of listening even more carefully and being quiet even longer so that we can fully comprehend in the dialogue what they're saying, even if we know, or at least we feel deeply, we're being accused unjustly because we perceive ourselves as virtuous. And it should set off as, as in a great I-thou love affair. You can hear from the thou a criticism you might not be able to hear from anyone else. We have to expand the circle of thou, especially when people who have been without voice by tradition are saying to us, this is the way you hurt me. Let's try to move forward. I, I think, though, the one limit, I mean, I, I, to me, this just shows why you are a much wiser person than I am. Because that sensitivity to others is what makes you a great teacher. But me, as the, as just, the, yeah. me as the, as the harsh negative person here, yeah, yeah. The, the limiting factor on this is when the harmed speaker, harmed person says, the very act of your speaking is an aggression against me. And so if I just take examples from the last couple of weeks, but there are many. Um, uh, a few weeks ago at Georgetown Law School, the head of the Department of Homeland Security was heckled off the stage and was not permitted to speak. Um, at the same time, uh, the Harvard Crimson was uh, fiercely criticized by students because the reporters there made the mistake of telephoning the Department of, uh, actually it was, I'm sorry, it was the Immigration Service um, to ask about a demonstration against the, the Trump administration policy and said, oh, tell us what you think about this demonstration. And they wrote down the response. And there was an outraged response saying, how dare you contact these people at all? They're the enemy. And so that mentality. Do you expect me to defend those examples? No, but I, yeah. I know, but I expect you to maybe say, but those are crazy outliers. I mean, I think the real question is, are those crazy outliers, or is this revelatory of something dangerous? Well, it, it, we can hold both those thoughts at the same time. It, it is, it is revelatory of something dangerous. I do not feel that a heckler's veto 
is part of, uh, or, or any silencing device of that sort, such as the Georgetown example, uh, is, is part of dialogic dialogue. Okay, it's, it's just the antithesis of it. And uh, the argument I make in the book is the way universities uh, can improve in this regard is by having clear rules. And, and I try to go through a set of examples in a nuanced way and talk about how universities, and especially those who lead them, and, and here I want to say I understand I have a minority view, but uh, as you know, I have strong views on a range of subjects, political and otherwise. For the 28 years I was dean and president, 14 at each, I gave up my rights of public political expression. I could express it in conversations with friends. Why? Because I thought it was more important for me single-mindedly to preserve the breadth of dialogue on, on campus. And one of the things that I would be willing to do would be to step out and say to the heckler's veto, that is a violation of our norms. Now that's, that's, that's different from let's have silence and listen carefully to what this person is saying. And then subject it to the kind of critical examination that we do in universities. So I think it's the role of the, the, the leader of the community not to indulge himself or herself, because you know, you're John Sexton, comma, the president of NYU, and it's hard to accept, but true, that nobody, not a reporter from the New York Times or, or from the National or anything else, is interested in the views of John from Brooklyn. They're interested in the right-hand side of the comma, the president of NYU. So, so you've got to give that up in order to, to be this umpire. Now, do I think that things like the examples you raise are typical on campuses? Uh, not by any genuine examination of the real numerator against the real denominator, OK? Uh, these because there is this cottage industry. There, there, are, there are organizations left and right in the United States that want to amplify and publicize these events. The data, which I have in the book, and it's footnoted, is overwhelming that this is a minuscule problem on a denominator of all the various speakers across the political spectrum that come to uh, campus, in classes and out. But if there's an event like that at Georgetown, it gets notoriety. There probably are a thousand events at Georgetown across the political spectrum that get no notoriety at all because it's, it's, it's uh, the dog biting the man, not vice versa. So, OK, let, let's then, well, the, 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 the final model, the model that you have created here and that we'll talk about is the global network university. But that has been created here. That has been created. Not that I'm I have sorry. created. Correct. Yeah. Uh, it's perfectly easy to imagine that you would have written a book like this, making the argument that you make about the university as the bulwark against this secular dogmatism with no reference at all to a global network university. You could have written such a book and said, that's why we have to adhere to these codes in the classroom, outside the classroom, et cetera. So, so talk about what it is in the nature of a global network university that most deeply advances the goals that you're talking about in this book. OK, so uh, two parts to this. First of all, I think if, if people can come to appreciate the core and essence of what we call the ecumenical university, and I, I don't want to make it very clear, there's a way in which that section of the book is about the global network at NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, and, I, and I use the global network and NYU Abu Dhabi as, in a way, proof of proposition. Okay, I, 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 it's not a history of NYU Abu Dhabi, and it's not an argument for NYU Abu Dhabi. It's not even a prediction that NYU Abu Dhabi uh, will maintain it, the, the kind of features that I describe, 
but uh, it, 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 NYU Abu Dhabi, 10 years in, undeniably is proof of the proposition of a greater kind of species of what a university could be, that it's my hope that there'll be five or 10 or 20 of in 50 years, okay? And, and, and if one can understand what that vision of a university is, because ecumenism requires this dialogic dialogue and, and radical listening. And if you can ref view the traditional university back through that lens, it kind of elevates your understanding of what the traditional university can do, even on its own terms. But then, in, in my, the arc of my argument, the section on the ecumenical university is where I move from defense to offense. And, and I essentially say, okay, you know, uh, we've at the very least got to put the houses of the traditional university in order because uh, nuance and complexity, the enterprise of thought is at stake. This is the last best hope. There are these forces in society. If we don't turn this dogmatism around, secular dogmatism into a secular human, there's going to be trouble. So, so that's, that's defense. But then I say, whoa, wait a minute. If we begin to go down that road, we begin to really live those skills, then one can dream of a world that's a community of communities. And one can think of certain universities like this one, incarnate, and again, not perfectly. You know better than I, it's not perfect, but you also know it's very different and very affirmative and very positive. And wouldn't it be great if the world could be what NYU Abu Dhabi is? Wouldn't it be great if the world could be what New York City is? An imperfect city, but a city that has a neighborhood for every country in the world inhabited by people that were born in that country. And if you go out into those neighborhoods, you see the identity of the country, the food, the music, the language, the prayers, all that's there. But if you say, what are you? The person says, I'm a New Yorker. So that's the world vision that if we can get to play offense, NY, so, so NYU Abu Dhabi pumps out 500 ecumenists a year you know, through the Sheikh Mohammed program and, and through, through uh, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi itself. And you're pumping out these 500 people who then go into diaspora around the world and, 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 and they do whatever they do. And after 50 years, there's 50 times 500 of them, and they're running everything in the world, and everybody's wondering why the world is. That's offense. So really, I mean, the, 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 uh, at the level of values and hopes, it's the rise of this word you love, a cosmopolitan, mentality, which you also hope will be the best way of dealing with this toxic nationalism, nativism that now is so much a part of our world. All these years and you finally understand me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read your book a bunch of times. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I need to ask you a question about that, and I've asked you this question before. Um, no, I thought about this a lot when I wrote my own book about liberalism. Like, you know, why do people hate liberals and liberalism so much? You and can ask why people hate me? Well, don't flatter yourself. It's not about <laughs> you. I, I, well, I, why, why do they hate me? I'm sorry. No, I, I knew it wasn't um, that. So. so, you know, we use this word elite institutions. It's one of the rare times when we quite openly use the word elite as a positive thing. But of course, it has a big negative valence too, right? And people who think that the liberalism is evil and they hate it, they use the word liberal elites. And what do liberal elites do? They go to these finishing schools that are called elite universities, Harvard and NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi and so on and so forth. So I, I guess the question is, how is it that this institution, the elite university, which by its very nature is elite, is the property of this tiny, we hope, meritocratic elite, is somehow gonna cure 
this problem of nationalism, nativism, whatever you want to call it, that in many ways, for the nationalists, these universities incarnate everything that they resent. So, so um, the, the, you, you really raise two questions at the same time. Uh, I'll, I'll put aside for the moment how we cause the, what you just referred to as the nationalists or the localists or whatever to perceive things differently. Let's talk the reality first, because no matter what they perceive, the reality is the more, more important. So um, even as I've been involved in this dream, there's been, as you know, a parallel dream called the University of the People. So the University of the People is, uh, if you're a high school graduate and you're fluent for the moment in English, we're about to put out an Arabic version as well, uh, you have access to the internet. And you have, for whatever reason, whether you're homeless or poor or whatever, remote, you have no other choice. You're automatically admitted. And you sign up for classes the same way you do here on this campus. And there's never more than 32 in a class. And there are volunteer professors that have uh, provided a curriculum. And you do peer-to-peer -peer learning. And at the end, there's an exam. And it's free. And it's now we have 20,000 students. And uh, I think it's getting close now to 200 countries around the world. Uh, so. Uh, the key thing in my mind, what connects to this, this idea elite uh, that you use, and we're using elite here in the positive sense, you know, for a few, right? How do you connect these two ideas? Because the University of the People, uh, subject uh, only to my capacity to raise funds for it, because we, we have one significant cost, and that is a secure exam at the end of each, each uh, course that costs us $100 per student per course. So there's a limit uh, right now. But we could go to a million students tomorrow if we had sufficient funding. Okay. But uh, the key thing is, uh, is the student, wherever he or she goes, in the place that is the right place for his or her talents and passions? Or have they been captured by virtue of birth or location or whatever without opportunity. Uh, are we giving to each child that which we would give to that child if he or she were our child? Uh, and, and if the University of People model only works if it becomes a search engine that enables the woman we find in Afghanistan as a woman we found in Afghanistan did ending up here at NYU Abu Dhabi. In other words, there, there has to be cooperation among the various actors. NYU Abu Dhabi can't do it by itself. But for 10 years, we've been finding students through the University of the People who, if, they're, if they show talent, I think it's some number a year, they get to come to Candidates Weekend. And nobody knows how they were found or how they got to Candidates Weekend unless they choose to tell. So, and, and you, one could make similar arguments, and I've now persuaded Berkeley and, and Edinburgh uh, to do the same thing. So what, what, we, to, to, what we really have to do as a matter of conscience around this word elite is make sure that if higher education is a set of sections of a symphony orchestra of learning, if a student has the, or a learner has the aptitude to be in the string section, you shouldn't send them to the brass section or the percussion section. And how do we as a society, now this, this is huge, and you know Gordon Brown and I are trying to, to, to work on this, but here, humankind is getting like, an F isn't a low enough grade for what we're getting, for what we're doing. I mean, there are 60 million children in the world right now who won't meet a single teacher in their entire lives. So, so uh, 
to talk about you know, how we get them to have a meaningful shot at NYU Abu Dhabi or Oxford or Baydar or Harvard is, is, is folly. Okay, but if we don't start, if we don't seize an inch, we're not ever going to make progress in this. And we're going to need to lay out an awful lot of things across the spectrum that runs from things like the University of the People to NYU Abu Dhabi. So, I want.